My name is Jennifer Pepra, and I work as a research officer at EveryMind. My presentation today is focused on the approach we use to develop our language guidelines for communicating about mental ill health, suicide, self-harm, alcohol and other drugs, and eating disorders. EveryMind is a leading institution that is dedicated to the prevention of suicide and mental ill health and we have been delivering best practice uh, prevention programs for over 30 years. Every Mind is located in the beautiful city of Newcastle in Australia. At Every Mind, we have five priority program areas, including best practice communication, which includes MindFrame, and the Awet and Matter project was delivered under MindFrame. So what was the problem that we identified? We realized that there was a lack of consistency with the language that was used to communicate about suicide, self-harm, mental health concerns, eating disorders, and the use of alcohol and other drugs in Australia. We also realized that there was a need for a greater awareness of the impact of language. And so in order to address this problem, we set out to develop an evidence-informed practical guidelines to support the consistent use of safe, accurate and non-stigmatizing language. And we did this through a number of processes. Um, to start off the whole process, we had a, a roundtable discussion with people with lived experience. And we did this for two main reasons. The first reason was to try and test whether the problem we had identified was an actual problem for people with lived experience. We also wanted their support on how to design the whole project. Now, people with the experience in the roundtable discussion shared their experiences of language use to communicate about mental health and suicide, and they also shared their views on how they felt the problem could be addressed. Now, outcomes from the roundtable discussion were used to inform the project research questions, as well as the support of the development of the Awet Matter guidelines. We also did scoping reviews of academic literature and se sector language, and from that scoping review, we found out that um, current guidelines are limited and that most policy documents and key resources do not include glossary. And they had a varied approach to the use of language. We also did some focus group discussions. Now, the focus group discussions were, we were 10 focus group discussions across three broad categories, including people with lived experience with 49 participants. Now, thematic analysis of the results established how participants preferred their lived and living experience to be depicted in words. Based on the evidence that we had gathered from the three stages that I've just described, 99 statements were developed that went into a Delphi consensus study. Now, a Delphi consensus study is an approach that is used to arrive consensus from experts on a topic. There were two rounds of the, the study. In the first round, 99 statements were presented to each of the three panelists and they scored their level of agreement with its inclusion in the guidelines. Now, from the first round, the responses were analyzed and another 44 list of statements were generated, which went into the second round of the study. Again, the panelists rated their agreements for inclusion of each of these statements into the guidelines. Results from the second stage were again analyzed by the research team and we developed 70, 70 statements which were agreed upon which went into the development of the guidelines. Now each of the three panelists had an equal weighting towards the percentage threshold. We also had some user testing and further consultations once the guidelines were developed. There were three rounds of user testing with Project Advisory Group. We also had a cultural sensitivity review performed by a locally based Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Mental Health Service. We also had some further consultations on the glossary from policymakers as well as people with lived experience. Now, the user testing was performed through a series of standardized questions with open ended responses as well. Now, these questions tested the usability, relevance, and functionality of the guidelines. And this, the testing was done through a number of approaches, including through emails, padlets, and red cap. 
Now, the results of all that work we had done went into the development of the actual guidelines. The guidelines is based on three main principles. The principle to do no harm, the principle to aim to do good, and the principle to stay curious and be open to change. The principle to do no harm encourages us to reflect on the language that we use to avoid terminology that reinforces stigma or discourages connection. The aim to do good principle encourages us to use language that supports connection, that promotes inclusion and acceptance of diversity. The final principle, which is stay curious and be open to change, helps us to understand that a language is evolving. And so we need to always be on top and stay updated and look at the changes that are occurring so that we apply them appropriately. Language can be helpful or harmful depending on the context that we, in which we use them. And so the recommendation, for example, is that when, when communicating about suicide, rather than using terms such as skyrocketing rates of suicide or suicide epidemic, the preferred term is to use terms like increased rates of suicide or higher rates of suicide. Another example, rather than using terms like set free, finally at peace or can rest at last, the preference is to use terms such as tragic death or a tragedy. So we are encouraging people that depending on the context that you are communicating in, there is a need for you to be conscious of the type of language that you use. Now, why was this work important? Our words carry power and they do have an impact. Now, the language that we use to communicate about complex experiences such as suicide, mental ill health, eating disorders, self-harm, alcohol and other drugs can be stigmatizing and can negatively influence attitudes and behavior. Now, if we use stigmatizing language to communicate about these complex um, experiences, they can serve as a barrier to help seeking or help offering within the community. However, when language is used positively, it can empower people and encourage people to seek help and offer support when they need it. So today I have a challenge for everybody. And my challenge is that if you identify terms used by your organization or your institution or in the research that you use that are non-preferred, problematic or outdated, I encourage you to make a positive step towards reducing potential harm by ad updating your internal policies as well as the language guidelines accordingly. We would like to acknowledge all those who contributed to this project, including the team at Every Mind. Thank you for listening.